Thank you everybody for coming to this screening and this conversation that we're going to have. And uh, one thing I've learned about book festival audiences, you're on time and you're obedient, and so thank you for being an <laughs> obedient crowd. Uh, <laughs> I'm Eric Erickson with the Friends of South Dakota Public Broadcasting. Anybody in here a friend of SDPB? I love it. You're my people. And uh, hopefully we're your people. And uh, we, we feel such a connection to the Festival of Books. And there was a crowd similar to this earlier at 11 o'clock when Lori hosted In the Moment. It was an excellent show. Uh, if you didn't catch it, you can catch it at uh, listen.sdpb.org later. It'll be there and available to you. So today, um, on, and there's just a couple other staff. If you're on the SDPB staff, just kind of raise your hand, Carol. There's Richard who's here. Uh, there's Aaron. He'll be, Aaron will be roaming around taking some photos. Brittany, where's Brittany at? Brittany's back here, and of course, Lori. Um, so Aaron will be wandering around taking some photos. So there may be a point at which he's standing in front of you who he won't stand there all day, I promise. Very yep. In addition to uh, our members making what we do possible on South Dakota Public Broadcasting, we also have corporate partners, and that's what I do for a living for Friends of SDPB. And so the two shows you're going to see here today were made partially possible with help from our corporate supporters. So if you know anybody with any of these organizations that I list, if you could do me a favor and pass along like, hey, I was at the screener at the Festival of Books, thank you for supporting that show. Great Plains Tribal Health, or excuse me, Great Plains Tribal Leaders Health Board, AARP of South Dakota. Anybody a member of AARP? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> How about uh, for any former educators or uh, South Dakota retired school personnel? Yep, they were, they're the educational arm of AARP, thanks to all of you. Custer State Park, and by the way, I'm gonna give a quick plug for Custer State Park. Coming up in uh, October is an event at Custer State Park on October 14th. I'm gonna ask for another hand raising. Anybody ever been to the Badger Hole? Yeah, Badger Clark's house out at Custer State Park. All day is, is a Badger Clark Day on October 14th. So when you stop by our booth out there in the exhibit hall, you'll learn more about Badger Clark and the documentary that we're doing about him named Poet Among the Pines, another great documentary coming up from SDPB. Related to the shows you're seeing today, you are invited on September 30th out to Red Cloud, which is now known by the Lakota name Makpia Luta. I think I came close to that. So out at Red Cloud on September 30th, we're having an all-day celebration of the American Buffalo, and it ends with a meal. So consider yourself invited to Makpia Luta on September 30th. And that's on the Pine Ridge. That's on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation, uh, correct. Right, correct. Uh, I think really that is all I had to do for introductions of things that aren't related to this. These shows that you're about to see screeners for, uh, we have about 16, 17 minutes of the Ken Burns show, The American Buffalo. And uh, it's, it's a four hour show, so we're gonna show it over two nights. We're gonna show the first segment on uh, October 16th, and we actually are gonna show them back to back. At six o'clock and eight, eight o'clock, we'll show segment one. And then the next night on the 17th, we'll show the next segment at six and eight. And then the South Dakota Public Broadcasting produced show called Tatanka will premiere on SDPB on October 19th at seven o'clock Mountain. So we're gonna watch the show, and then Lori will lead a panel with our panelists. So without further ado, let's roll the show. <clears throat> Stories hold the power to draw us together and shape our tomorrow. If we're courageous enough to look, lessons are written in our history. Major funding for the American Buffalo was provided by the Better Angel Society and its members, the Margaret A. Cargill Foundation Fund and the St. Paul and Minnesota Foundation, Diane and Hal Breyer, the Keith Campbell Foundation for the Environment, John and Catherine Debs, Kissick Family Foundation, Fred and Donna Siegel, by Jacqueline Mars, John and Leslie McQuan, and Mr. and Mrs. Paul Tudor Jones. Funding was also provided by the Valjeanah Foundation and by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. <laughs> 
and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. When the buffalo are here, the land is good. When the land is good, the buffalo are healthy. We have lived here for 600 generations. We have been here conservatively 12,000 years. So if you think about that 12,000 years, imagine that on a timeline, and then take that 12,000 years and wrap that timeline around a 24-hour clock. What that means is that Columbus arrived at about 11.28 p.m., mm -hmm. and Lewis and Clark at about 15 minutes before midnight. Native Americans seamlessly wove the animals into every aspect of their daily lives and religious beliefs. The buffalo was iconic and sacred and became so deeply ingrained in the life of the tribe that they could not imagine existence without the buffalo. In the ancient origin stories of many tribes, the bison were among the earliest animals <laughs> created often emerging before human beings from underground in what became sacred sites, like Wind Cave in the Black Hills of what is now South Dakota, or Oklahoma's Wichita Mountains, whose most prominent peak is now called Mount Scott. The Kiowas in particular believed that this was the mountain from which Buffalo had originally emerged and that whenever they went away, and Buffalo did go away in the remembered histories of tribal people, this is where on the Southern Plains the Buffalo went. The Cheyenne and Lakota each have their own stories about a contest between people and bison to determine which one would have mastery over the other. In a long and arduous race circling the Black Hills, some of the animals died and stained the soil red forever with their blood. In the end, the people won. The old buffalo bulls called the young man to come to them. Well, you have won, they said. You are on top now. All we animals can do is supply the things that you will use from us. Our meat and skins and bones. And we will teach you the sun dance. John stands in timber. Every tribe on the plains held ceremonies related to the buffalo, who it was said had their own families and clans, their own societies and customs, and were capable of changing forms to communicate directly with humans. The Mandan in what is now North Dakota had the white buffalo cow society, respected older women whose leader wrapped herself in the robe of a rare and sacred white buffalo as they danced all night to call the bison herds closer. In a different ceremony, experienced hunters costumed themselves as buffalo bulls whose power, called medicine, could be shared with others in the tribe. The first thing I was told about buffalo was not really the hunting part of it. First thing I was told about them was the spirituality part of it, about how they were created by our Creator, how they were put on this earth to to help us survive, not only with clothing, with warmth, with food, with tools, but with the essential, which was the spirit of the buffalo, and how the spirit was part of us and we were part of them. Each summer, the Lakota, like many tribes, gathered for a sun dance their most important ceremony, which renewed their relationship with Wakantanka, the great spirit of the universe that permeates everything. Buffaloes were considered the animal with the most direct connection to that life force. Over the course of many generations, the Kiowa had moved from the mountains near the headwaters of the Yellowstone River, down to the Northern Plains, then to the Black Hills, and eventually farther south to the Wichita Mountains in what is now Oklahoma. Along the way, they learned their Sundance from the Crows. The Sundance was an indispensable part of the Kiowa life. 
and the buffalo was the sacrificial victim of the Sundance. Could not have a Sundance without killing a buffalo bull and uh, displaying its head in the Sundance Lodge. What more valuable a sacrifice could you make than to kill a buffalo and offer it to the sun? You don't just go out and kill a buffalo. You go to your ceremonies, you pray, and you ask for the gift of a buffalo. You ask that a buffalo will give itself to you. And it's a spiritual relationship. You do everything in prayer, and you do everything with a pure heart. Stripped of its hide, each carcass provided hundreds of pounds of meat, which could be roasted or boiled, cut into strips and dried on racks, or mixed with tallow and berries to make pemmican, a dehydrated concoction that was easier to transport, preserved the meat longer, and provided five times the food value per pound. From the moment a Plains Indian child was born and wrapped in a soft layer of buffalo hair and a tanned calfskin, to the time his or her corpse was shrouded in a bison robe, every day of life was connected with the buffalo. In winter, when the bison's fur was the thickest, its hide would be tanned and turned into a warm robe. In the summer, when the hides had less hair, they could be sewn together into coverings for teepees. Stretched over a frame of curved willow branches, a hide was transformed into a bowl-like boat for crossing rivers. A buffalo's bladder became a water container, its shoulder blade a digging tool, its horn a spoon or a cup. Buffalo teeth became ornaments. Some women painted their faces with buffalo grease to protect their complexions from the sun and use the rough side of a buffalo tongue to brush their hair. Tendons were turned into bowstrings and the sharpened horn fragment into an arrowhead. Dried buffalo droppings made fuel for fires, an essential commodity on the nearly treeless plains. So nothing was wasted. Even the waste wasn't wasted. Everything was used except for the grunting. Uh, and even then they were using some of the ceremonies, I'm sure, to, to imitate the buffalo. So, so even the sounds were used. It gives itself to the people as a sacrifice. Here I am, you can make use of me, I can help you. We can be related on a spiritual plane. Whenever the buffalo periodically disappeared, special ceremonies were required to call them back. So when they did something wrong, the buffalo might well react and withhold their affection. No, I will not make myself available to you for hunting. I will hide. Uh, you will have to find me, and it will not be easy. The stories almost always convey a sense that it's been human hubris that's caused the animals to withdraw. And the only way to get them back is to perform some kind of really profound ceremony, some act that convinces the animals and the animal masters who are in charge of them that humans are once again willing to be fellow travelers in the world. Not exceptional, not standing apart, but part of the ecology of all living things. The Cheyenne had followed them so closely and for so many years, they had 27 different words for a buffalo, depending on its sex, age, or condition. As I now think upon those days, a Cheyenne named Wooden Leg remembered, it seems that no people in the world ever were any richer than we were. But the Cheyenne prophet Sweet Medicine had also given his people a warning. There is a time coming. Many things will change. 
strangers will appear among you. <coughs> their skins are light colored and their ways are powerful. These people do not follow the way of our great grandfather. They follow another way. In 1913, the United States came out with a new design for the nickel, done by the sculptor James Earl Fraser. Fraser said he wanted a coin that could not be mistaken for any other country's coin. On one side, the new nickel showed the profile of an American Indian. On the other was an American buffalo, modeled after a bison Fraser saw in New York City's Central Park Menagerie. We know its name, called Black Diamond, and it lived in a cage, and he uses it as his model. And it was sold to a butcher, and the model for the buffalo head nickel was processed and parted out and sold as meat in the meatpacking district in Manhattan. And it opens up this idea of just how conflicted the symbol is. We look at it, and we see a symbol of wilderness and a symbol of the wanton destruction of wilderness. You look at that old nickel, there's a buffalo. At one time, they almost wiped him to extinction. Why did the European put that buffalo on that nickel? Was it just a curiosity or was it something that kind of meant something to him in an odd way? So in my confusion, <laughs> And my need to understand is, do you have to destroy the things you love? By 1933, the American Bison Society reported that 4,404 buffalo existed in 121 herds in 41 different states. Half of them were grazing in now nine government protected herds. Compared to the millions of buffalo that had once covered the plains, those were tiny numbers, but enough. And in enough different places that the Bison Society began making plans to disband, declaring that the American buffalo was finally safe from extinction. The society was successful, but their understanding of the problem was really short-sighted. They didn't know about ecosystems. They thought if you got a buffalo, you saved them. That's not it. You gotta save their habitat. That same spring of 1933, 75 calves were born on the National Bison Range in Montana. One of them, a little bull, had blue eyes and white hair, a genetic rarity. A white buffalo is so sacred and so full of hope and goodwill for the tribes. Just a huge blessing. It was a tremendous gift from Creator. The staff at the Bison Range called the little bull Whitey at first, and its presence turned the preserve into a tourist attraction for a while. But to the Salish, Kootenay, and Pondere on the Flathead Reservation, and to virtually all other native tribes, a white <laughs> buffalo was more than a statistical oddity. It had special spiritual power and sacred meaning. It was considered big medicine. And that became his name. I was three years old. My grandpa and my dad took me to the bison range and wanted me to touch him. He was so old, he stood inside this fence and he didn't move. I touched him and I thought he would be soft. His hand, like my teddy bear, and it was bristly. And that was my first impression was, he's big and I love his eyes and he's bristly. Uh, 
I think it's really important to teach our youth the cultural relevance of the buffalo because it's what sustained our ancestors. Our whole culture really is based on the buffalo and how it provides for us and how we can provide for it. And from a food sovereignty perspective, I think it's really important to learn how to use the meat and how to sustain ourselves and know that like we don't have to go to the grocery store. It's provided by nature. Every indigenous person wants to feel associated with the tribe. They want that competence. And what we've done is found that competence in food. I just want to be hopeful that there's others, you know, in the future who are going to do this because, you know, back then we lived like this. We need to keep that, you know, hold on to it forever because that's all we have now, you know, this culture, this way of life. Share our Lakota ways with all of these young children. We want to teach people what we know. And that feeling is unbelievable. We are in the comeback story that our ancestors have dreamt about. start the panel discussion part of this conversation so I'll just ask our panelists to either come find your chair or move your chairs to the stage front here and I'll read their introductions uh, for you here. Michelle Nyhouse is the author of the book Beloved Beasts Fighting for Life in an Age of Extinction. It is a history of the modern conservation movement. It was named one of the best books of 2021 by the Chicago Tribune, Smithsonian Magazine, book list and other publications. Nyhouse is a longtime editor of High Country News and a regular contributor to the New York Review of Books. After 15 years off the electrical grid in rural Colorado, she and her family now live in White Salmon, Washington. Joseph Marshall III is a teacher, historian, writer, storyteller, and Lakota craftsman. Raised by his maternal grandparents in a traditional household on the Rosebud Sioux Indian Reservation, he is an enrolled member of the Sichangu Lakota tribe. Marshall published his first book in 1991. He's written 17 more since, mostly nonfiction, focusing on Lakota history, issues, and culture. He is an adjunct instructor at Sintagleska University and a board member of Lakota <coughs> Youth Development. Dan O'Brien is a falconer, a wildlife biologist, a rancher, and the founder of Wild Idea Buffalo Company. His books include The Spirit of the Hills in the Center of the Nation and the 2009 One Book South Dakota, Buffalo for the Broken Heart. O'Brien has received two National Endowment for the Arts Individual Artist Grants, two Western Heritage Awards, and a 2001 Bush Creative Arts Fellowship. He contributed an essay to the 2023's On Common Ground. And Richard Tubles. He's a Rapid City native who works as a reporter and producer for South Dakota Public Broadcasting. He's a U.S. Navy veteran and was a mass communications specialist. He's an enrolled member of the Oglala Lakota tribe on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation. Richard Tubles has covered a number of topics that directly relate to Native Americans, and he is based in SDPB's Black Hills Studios in South Dakota, and he's my good friend. So thanks for joining <laughs> And I arm wrestled him into being here today. <laughs> We're gonna um, ask some questions. We're all gonna share a microphone, and uh, we'll try to leave time for your questions. So just think a little bit about who you have access here to and what you'd like to ask them the most. I wanna start with uh, Joseph Marshall please, and um, the importance in the beginning of this documentary, we see a story of the great race, and very much in your upbringing, as a person who had Lakota as their first language, that storytelling was so important to you as a young person. Let's start with that, and tell me a little bit about the importance of oral storytelling before we had documentary films 
beyond the books that you've written, what does that mean to you? Well, I didn't see a television until I was maybe 13 years old. Mm. I didn't see a movie until I was about the same age, maybe 12. And I could understand sort of the concept of a movie where it had to be explained to me that those pictures were moving and they were there and there was no one else there. But when I saw a TV in a big box, it was black and white, I had to look behind it to see <laughs> if really there was no one inside of it. Maybe there was little people. That's what I thought. So that was my introduction to modern communication, if you will. Up until that time, uh, I was fortunate enough to grow up with old people, my grandparents and their generation. So all of their contacts were 50, 60, 70, 80 years old. And they all told stories, only in Lakota. So the, like the story of the great race, uh, stories of my grandfather's role at the Little Bighorn, great-grandfather's role at the Little Bighorn, all the Ikotomi stories, everything that I heard was in Lakota. That was my entertainment, but more than it, it was my schooling. Those stories not only entertain, it, they teach about life. Once you know the stories inside and out, they offer lessons about life. And just as importantly, a connection to identity and history and heritage. And so that's what those stories did for me. So it's only natural that I would have wanted to, to tell the rest of the world about what that mechanism was. So the, the, in, in what I learned early on about bison, katanka or pate, I learned from my grandparents about stories of how, not only how they were hunted, but what they meant as uh, spiritual partners, if you will, in, in life and how we became uh, in a symbiotic relationship with them, physically and spiritually. And all of that I learned, I heard about in Lakota. Thank you. Richard Tubles, you were also fortunate to have some wonderful elders and old people in your life. Did you two grow up hearing Stories. Um, yeah, my uh, great grand or my grandfather uh, Robert Grant Tubles was a, he was Episcopal priest and uh, he loved to talk and listen. And all I did was sit around and listen. But part of that generation where they didn't teach uh, the Lakota teach Lakota to us. So and him and my grandmother wanted to. Uh, not let his kids listen on what they're talking about, they'd switch to Lakota. So I was just like, oh, I want to hear it. But, you know, the reason for that was they were both um, went to boarding schools and they moved to uh, Rapid City when they got married at a young age. And they, <clears throat> they knew that in order for my dad and his siblings to survive and live out in the world off the reservation that they needed to speak English. So they didn't give them that opportunity to speak Lakota and, you know, obviously there's that trickle down effect that's happening with not only the language but the culture, the traditions and, you know, uh, I wish that growing up I would, I could remember a lot of those stories that he told but essentially, yeah, it's kind of steeped in a generation that was kind of transitioning from those old ways to the 50s with the boarding school generation to growing up in the 60s, 70s, and 80s where they were just trying to make a life for themselves. And uh, places like Rapid City weren't too friendly for that generation to live in, so it was just a matter of surviving and passing on some of those <clears throat> work ethics and values that everyone has to survive in that era. So. Sorry, I got off tangent a little bit, but Not yeah. Not <laughs> Not <at all>. <laughs> I want to talk about how close we came to extinction based on the, some of the things that I've read in Michelle's book, and then bring Dan O'Brien into the conversation to talk about 
if we've reached a tipping point toward restoration or how far away we are from that. So Michelle, tell us a little bit about your research into the conservation movement as a whole and the important role the bison and the near extinction of the bison came, how, how close we came to that. Hi, great to be here. Um, so the bison were extremely uh, central to what we call the modern conservation movement because for many, many years, um, people in North America and Europe, white society in North America and Europe, really believed that species endured forever, <coughs> unchanged. They were created by God and no human activity could diminish or increase them or change them. And the decline and near extinction of the bison was a wake up call that, that even physically powerful, tremendously abundant species could be driven extinct by human activities. And a few people within these societies stood up, had the foresight and had the resources to stand up and say, look, this is a moral wrong. We have to do what we can um, to prevent that from happening. And they took some, you know, their motivations were very mixed, as I talk about in my book, and, and they had definitely had some enormous blind spots, but they took some actions that were incredibly important um, to preserving an opportunity to, to restore the bison and to really to preserve the opportunity for the kind of restoration movement, the indigenous-led restoration movement that we're seeing today. And Dan, I want to ask you about your partnerships with tribes in a moment. But first, for people who don't know you, help them understand how you became <laughs> a buffalo rancher and an author and those first seeds of understanding of the importance of the bison to the grasslands. Help us understand your origin story and how you, how you come to this conversation. It's so fascinating. Um. First of all, it's good to be up here with Richard and Joseph, who I've known for a long time, um, and Michelle, who I just got to know. Um, my story begins with a little kid in Ohio in the 40s. I'm an old guy. Um, and, you know, talking about your grandfather, my, my I remember my dad was a cement guy, you know, a cement mixer guy. And he had his buddies come over when we got our first television set. And it was about the size of a Volkswagen. And, uh, <laughs> and they were wrestling in there, and they're all sweaty. And, and finally, he gets set up, turn it on, and you know, there's one station, and you can't hardly see it. My dad stood up and said, Well, he says, this is never going to last. <laughs> <laughs> he said, It ain't worth a shit. <laughs> but you know what? He was half right. <laughs> <laughs> so back to Buffalo. <laughs> you know, I was I grew up in Ohio uh, in the 40s and 50s, and Ohio was a dying place at that time. Um, it was all construction. It looked a lot like Rapid City does today. And uh, I found my way out here to go to graduate school. I fell in love with the Great Plains. I've been out here for over 50 years. Um, I worked for a couple of the conservation groups, uh, the Game Fishing Parks here in South Dakota, and then the Peregrine Fund out of Cornell, and um, with endangered species, actually. <coughs> um, my job with Cornell was to drive up and down the Rocky Mountain front and release peregrine falcons on the cliffs. And so I did that for eight years. I drove down through the Great Plains probably hundreds of times. Every year I got a little sicker. See the agriculture, see all those animals in feedlots, hard to find a place to eat where you could even talk English, um, lots of poor people. And I decided to give it up come back to South Dakota, had a little place up north, Sturgis, and I was gonna naively try to bring back that ecosystem 
it was not a bad, it wasn't really beat up like a lot of places are, but it was pretty beat up. It didn't take me long, four or five years, to realize that 700 acres on the Great Plains isn't even worth talking about. So, I, uh, and also, if you're going to re reclaim, regenerate the Great Plains, it doesn't take you very long to start thinking about buffalo. Um, when I had a chance, I got a few little buffalo very naively, put them in pastures, let them run around. And I, I realized that, that it's really not about the buffalo. It's about where the buffalo live. They do just fine if you give them what they need. That was 50 years ago. Now, <coughs> we've, uh, understand this, I drive a car with 300,000 miles on it. I don't have any children. Um, and I've done those things because I wanted to save these landscapes. Um, we are probably too late to really save the buffalo because the buffalo mean the grass, means the prairie dogs, it means all of it. It means a free life where you can move around. We don't have any of those. So I think we're playing catch up now. And I think we're gonna have to just do the best we can, which is gonna be pretty tough. Thank you. Let's talk more about catch up or next steps or the big picture and Joseph Marshall, when we think about restoration, where do we begin? What are the principles that we stand upon to move forward, knowing what we know now about what has already been done to the landscape? Well, I think as Dan pointed out, it's not just about the buffalo, it's about the environment that supports it. Because if you know the history of bison in North America, they proliferated because they had an endless supply of grass and water and the kind of environment they needed to, to live and to thrive and to keep on propagating. Um, right across the, the, the road from where I live, southeast of Mission, is a herd of buffalo. Uh, they belong to the Cynthia Gillespie University, about 100 head. And I noticed a couple of years ago that they didn't look as big as some of the old photos that I've seen of bison in the past. And then I saw a short film about the current status of buffalo, and maybe Dan can attest to this. One of the things that that film said was that the bison were not, or today are smaller because they're not roaming as far as they did back when, when they had thousands and thousands of acres and miles and miles and miles of prairies to run across, when they were living the life that they were intended to live. But now, even though there are herds that are being regenerated, they don't have the space to roam, so they're smaller. They've adjusted to the conditions. So I think that's what we need to do if we're going to continue to see buffalo come back, we have to give them the room. And I don't know if we as human beings, as, as, as Americans, are ready to give them back that room. So therein lies the rub. Richard, will you tell us a little bit about Tatanka, which you've been working on. It's an ongoing STPB documentary series, but what are some of the activities that you have found in the tribes that people are doing overall? What's been interesting to you? Yeah, I think um, in regards to, um, just to kind of echo off what these gentlemen have said there, you know, every mostly every tribe in the state has their own uh, buffalo management uh, program where they're guiding their, they're trying to build their own herds, which I think is, you know, it's kind of, you gotta look at the good and the bad, I guess, when you take that into account, but they're, 
they're utilizing that for exercising their sovereignty and their tribal rights and to, um, excuse me, <clears throat> to um, use it to feed their people like during COVID, you know, the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe, they gave out a bunch of buffalo meat. But, you know, I think it's really interesting that they're trying, you know, in uniting like with the Intertribal Buffalo Council mm -hmm. to rebuild not only in South Dakota, but the last I heard, they were sending two buffalo bulls down to Florida for a tribe that recently got recognized, and they sent four buffalo up to a tribe in Alaska. So it's all across the board in regards to people working together, tribes and natives and non-natives alike, trying to uh, regenerate the population. But I think the biggest thing with Tatanka way of life is, you know, there's a lot of sadness and atrocities that have happened in the past and in this documentary, and I try not to highlight that because I think a lot of people already realize and understand that. And what I look forward to most is, and it's not, and I try to keep it within the scope of uh, Tatanka Buffalo. And, you know, I'm really excited because we, you know, Red Cloud is having a Immersion Lakota language classes with all their students mm -hmm. and you know, they told the story of the white buffalo calf woman in English and Lakota, and we have a renowned artist working on panels of artwork to show alongside them telling that story. I mean, it's really beautiful seeing these young children speak in a tongue that I never got to learn other than, <laughs> not the good words sometimes, but, <laughs> but it's, it's really nice to not only see the efforts that these all these groups within the tribes and all these other nonprofits do to bring back the culture. But going back to Tatanka, Way of Life, you know, it, it's focused solely on the buffalo and the passing of the traditions that were used and to the next generation so that they could teach their kids and so on and so forth. So that's kind of the gist of it. And, you know, we're working a lot with Red Cloud to, and possibly even other schools. So this Tatanka documentary is gonna be one of many that we'll be trying to focus on in order to bring those stories that are positive because a lot of stuff that comes from reservations sometimes seem in a negative aspect. And we're not here to do that. We're here to promote the great things that are happening to bring back this culture, so. Michelle, one of the themes of your book is just this ongoing question of how are we to live in the natural world? How did the research that you did and the writing of it transform your own relationship mm. to landscape? Um, well, uh, let me, <laughs> I, I'm kind of inclined to broaden it out and and uh, talk about how it affected my thinking about the conservation <coughs> movement in general, and which I think and it reflects that also reflects back on how it changed my thinking about the natural world. But um, just in, in looking at both the accomplishments and flaws of the modern conservation movement over the last century or so, um, I would say that perhaps its its greatest failing, and this goes back to a lot of the racism and elitism at its roots is that um, it has always, uh, or often, um, defaulted to top-down approaches. And one of the reasons why the bison restoration movement that's happening has been ha and has been happening over the past couple of decades is that that is very much, it's getting support from the federal, federal government and other institutions, but it's very much a, a grassroots movement led by individual people and individual tribes um, who are all working together toward a larger goal. And so in that way, I think it's an example to everyone who cares about conservation that it is possible to carry out a conservation project that really works from the ground up and um, and and is a ecological and a social uh, restoration. I think some of the ideas that kind of break the brains of white conservationists, like, gosh, is it possible to hunt an animal and also protect it, or 
are humans really a part of nature? I mean, these are fundamental ideas to many Native American traditions. It's just like, well, of course, of course this is possible. And so I think bringing those ideas um, uh, into a movement where the, you know, the conservation movement is, is a participant, but not, not the sole leader, I think is really exciting. And, and so that, I suppose, has changed my, my perception of the way I live in the, the natural world, just because it's given me hope for the future. Um, that this can, con conservation can be done right, so to speak. We're going to take questions in a minute, but first, Dan, I wanted to ask you about how important partnerships are with people, especially through the work that you've done at Wild Idea. Well, you know, uh, the Wild Idea, the, the company, uh, was, we've got, I don't know, 900 buffalo now. Um, somehow or another they got to pay their way back and uh, so we started selling the meat which is uh, is I think a positive thing um, just as Michelle was saying uh, they in every way symbolically uh, realistically um, they are food and we have to be uh, we have to understand that we have to understand a bunch of things first of all is never ever in any of our lifetimes going to be such a thing as a wild buffalo. Forget it. There's a fence around every single buffalo. Um, so we have to take some some new and fresh ideas and I forget what the question was. <laughs> <laughs> with tribal communities. Yeah, we, you know, from, we live, we have eight miles of fence between us and Pine Ridge. And so we're working that fence line and know a lot of these guys and, and they know us. Um, I don't really see that much difference, honestly. We've tried our best to employ as many Native Americans as we can. We worked on Pine Ridge and um, Rosebud and Cheyenne River and some tribes in, in North Dakota. Um, and we've done our best to harvest their buffalo for them to basically buy the buffalo for them so they have a, a, a little bit of money trickling in. And it's, uh, it's kind of worked, but uh, no offense guys, but working on the reservation is tough. It's really tough. And, uh, uh, but we do our best. And I think we, we got a lot of friends on the reservation now because of that. Uh, I get invited to three sun dances every year. You know, that's a good sign. So uh, uh, I think it's important. I think that that is, you know, as I said before, symbolically, um, the buffalo has brought us together, um, and I think they could be uh, could bring the conservation people together and become more realistic, which I think would be a good turn. So yeah, I mean, it's their connectors always have been. I just wanted to add that while it is true that in our lifetimes we will never see a buffalo outside a fence, um, on the Blackfeet Reservation earlier this summer, uh, bison that have, had been um, are ancestral to the tribe had been um, brought back from Canada in 2016 just this summer were released from their paddock and are now free to wander back and forth across the boundary of the reservation and Glacier National Park. So they, they, they would run into a fence if they wandered far enough, <laughs> but they are not in a paddock like so many bison are. And it was, it's a really exciting idea to think about them wandering back and forth across these jurisdictional boundaries that have been, you know, um, just enforced for so long to the detriment of both people and migratory animals. I will bring the microphone to you. Who has a question they would like to ask? I got a quick one. So I, I know the white buffalo is very, you know, spiritual and all that. And there was one born in Bear River State Park in Evanston. And I'm wondering if you're incorporating your heritage, incorporating that into all this conversation? Well, we should. Right. Yeah, as video said, any time a, a white buffalo is born, it's uh, it's 
at the very least important to us for a lot of reasons, spiritually for one, and it, it, it's part of our culture, it's part of one of the stories in our culture. So, you know, we get excited anytime we hear about that. But very few of those white buffalo are born out of tribal herds once in a while. So when it's born in tribal herd, then we can relate to it in a different way. If it, it belongs to someone else, it's difficult to really connect with it then. Um, but it, we get we do get excited, I mean, you know, as, as Native people, every time we hear about a white buffalo. Other questions? I was wondering if um, what about um, yeah our bison, but um, how many of you have heard or seen the Ramalos, the first generation? Anybody? Yahoo. Nobody. Really? Okay, I did not dream this. It this really happened. In um, I seen them, and I often wondered what happened to them because. Um, I was in um, my freshman year of college, and um, the Indian studies, or we didn't have Indian studies then, but our um, Indian um, advisor took us on a field trip um, across America to meet other tribes and um, universities and what have you. And we were coming from Haskell um, Indian School in, in Kansas, and just before we got to the Oklahoma Panhandle, going to Arizona, or the southern states, I believe, um, there was a sign. I'll never forget this sign. It says, "Come and see the Bromelo." Hmm. And and they and so the teacher says, "You want to check it out?" And I said, "Yes." I'm. I said, "I do." And and what they were doing, they were crossbreeding the bison with domestic cattle. Mm -hmm. And it was so awfully sad. I, you know, I just cried with, the, with their animals because the Angus bull that they crossbred the, the um, bison, uh, um, her, with, it was just this humongous black giant animal <laughs> and it had short black hair. And, and but it looked like a, a, a bison. It had the the, the uh, shape of a bison, but it was so huge. And I remember the Hereford, the white faced Hereford cattle, and that and this this um, this animal that they created. It was it was red like a, a, a red cattle, but it had the white face that was shaped of the bison. And, and that one, I just couldn't get over because we were watching them, you know, there was four of them. And they, and they were literally crying, oh, wow. oh. these animals and that. So oh. I'm, I'm, I'm surprised you all haven't heard about them. But there were two more, but I don't remember them, but I remember those first two. Yeah. Well, I haven't seen them, but I will say that at Buffalo have been bred with cattle, both intentionally and unintentionally, for many, many, many years. And, and I believe there's been some genetic work on, on bison throughout their range. And I believe some, most of them contain at least some bison genes. And if you, if you go to see specimens that were taxidermied a century ago, um, it's actually kind of striking because they're a slightly different shape. They're, you know, you can tell that there's been some genetic change over the years. I think the good thing is that the bison we have today can still perform the same ecological role as the bison we had a century ago. Uh, they can still help restore and preserve the prairie ecosystem. I think we are going to release our room to the next group and be respectful of our time limit here, but the Ken Burns uh, special 
both days of it, four hours of it, I'm sure will bring up a lot of uh, conversation for anybody who watches it and the people that you talk to. And Tatanka will be an ongoing project, and I hope that you send your feedback to STPB as well about what else you would like to see in that, um, in that storyline. So thank you so much to our panelists, if you join me in thanking them for their time. <laughs> We appreciate all of you. Thanks so much for coming.